Okay, so Monday was the Ontario Municipal Election. I'm sure many of you already know that. Um, and this was an interesting election because uh, of the use and deployment of online voting. Um, I don't actually have the numbers on the rates of use of online voting, but we're talking about you know millions of people. Uh, so in that regard, it makes it one of the largest deployments of online voting in the world. And uh, I think there are some lessons that we can uh, learn from this. Uh, so as a background, Ontario has uh, 444 municipalities. They're, they're you know, different uh, tiers of governance. Uh, so Ottawa and Toronto are single tier, and then you have uh, smaller towns that are lower tier that assemble themselves into kind of county or region relationships in an upper tier uh, council. Uh, elections happen every four years, and so um, we have four years to kind of look at what happened on Monday and, and for, well, and Monday and Tuesday, and <laughs> decide what we want to uh, do for 2022. Um, and sort of this, the central document that kind of allows all of this stuff to happen is the um, Municipal Elections Act, which has a provision for uh, what's called alternative voting methods. Now, uh, the MEA does not have the word internet or the word online appearing in the document anywhere. Uh, it was written during the Windows 95 era, and uh, as far as I can tell, online voting had never happened. Um, and so there are no procedures for many of these um, alternative methods that are being used, uh, and the NEA basically leaves it up to the cities to come up with their own procedures uh, for these systems. So to give you a sense of uh, the growth here, um, so this is, a, this is a graphic produced by Intellivote, uh, the largest uh, online voting provider in, in Ontario this election. Um, and uh, basically this graph uh, shows that each election cycle, like you know, 12 to 20 to 44 uh, to 97, it's doubling. Each time it's doubling, that's exponential growth. Uh, so if this trend continues, uh, we'll be at almost 100% uh, in 2022, although after Monday, I'm not sure uh, if it will double again. Uh, we'll see. So, um, well, here's a question. Uh, who uses online voting? There's 444 municipalities. Which ones are using it? Uh, seems like a natural question to ask. Unfortunately, the Ontario Ministry of Municipal Affairs doesn't actually track this. And I know because I asked them. Um, and so we were kind of on our own to figure it out uh, for ourselves. Um, so if you want to sit down and figure that out, you've got to know uh, the names of all the, the municipalities. And if you go to the, uh, the MMA website, there's a list of all the municipalities, but many of the URLs are broken or outdated. So for example, here's the website for uh, the link if you click on for Matawan, Ontario, and uh, for Larder Lake. Um, so I brought this to the MMA's attention and they're going to do something about it, hopefully in time for the next election. <laughs> um, so we had to collect this data the hard way, uh, so we had to go and for all 444 cities, go and actually find the genuine URL. Um, and then from there, we actually have to scour the council minutes to try to infer A, who was using it, and B, uh, what vendor uh, they were working with. Uh, and then from there, we kind of had to try to sleuth out what the URL was of the voting website because we wanted to, you know, do some additional engineering, sort of, you know, cybersecurity uh, data collection on that. Not much that we can do. It's a live election, after all. Uh, but you know, certainly we can answer some basic questions like where is the server, um, how is the login page configured, that kind of thing. Uh, oh, and uh, the other the other point to make is that uh, many of the cities did not publish the URLs of their election website. And ostensibly this was for security reasons. And um, Mark Montero is an interesting case because uh, they're one of the only cities that I noticed where the council members uh, on social media did not say what, <laughs> did not let it slip what the actual URL, URL was. I believe that Markham probably uh, coached them to not say that, just say, wait till you get your voter registration card in the mail, the link's on that. Uh, but we found the link anyway, so sorry, Markham. <laughs> so um, here's the vendor distribution as far as we can tell. Uh, the IntelliVote numbers of 194 cities, um, according to our own results, is a little bit high. Uh, we found fewer cities using online voting, but these are preliminary results. We'll have to, uh, uh, you know, get, you know, we'll have to cross-reference them uh, if we can get a hold of uh, uh, IntelliVote's like actual list. Uh, but here's the breakdown that we saw. So the largest uh, provider is IntelliVote, um, 
But Intellivo, working with Seidel, which is a Spanish-based company, uh, they work in partnership, and uh, the partnership roughly can be described as like Intellivo is sort of the business front end, and then Seidel is the technology back end. Um, so then the next largest provider is Dominion, who you all know about now from the news, and uh, the third uh, being Simply Voting Now. There was one city that we saw uh, just using Seidel in partnership alone, and that was Markham because they have been using online voting for a long time, and uh, they just had a pre-existing relationship. Okay, so here are a few observations. Um, I think the important thing to, to say is that there's no smoking gun here, uh, and you know, thank goodness for that. Uh, but I think there are a few changes that we can make going forward, and uh, I hope that we can actually politically realize these changes. So one thing is that, you know, some of the vendors are making privacy claims that I, I have questions about. Like, for example, saying that, um, that it is impossible for municipal staff or employees or someone in the vendor to um, recover how you voted. Uh, from a technological perspective, based on what I've seen, there's no evidence to support that claim, um, except for the encryption going on at the tra at the transport layer. Sorry to use the term. Uh, there's no encryption going on uh, at the application layer. So whatever the server sees, it's seeing your unencrypted vote, uh, along with some kind of session cookie that identifies who you are. Um, so. I, I think that maybe they need to, um, we need to have some more clarification about some of the claims that are being made. Uh, here's another one. Um, I have residents from all over Ontario emailing me, telling me their stories. Um, apparently, uh, the envelopes that um, have the pins that give you the login credentials to log in are see-through. You hold them up to a bright light and you can read the entire thing. So, you know, there's something we might like to do for 2022 is actually have uh, opaque, you know, pins. Um, if you've ever got a credit card in the mail, uh, they use a technology called Hydalam. It's that kind of little black and white kind of swirlies and you peel it off. Maybe we could do something like that. Um, no, it's, it's only your voting card with your credential after all. Uh, and we have also been getting a lot of anecdotal reports about people getting voting cards uh, to their house from you know, children that have moved away, parents that have passed away. Um, in even one case, there was a dog who received a pin. Um, I don't know how that happened, but it did. Uh, and, and people are, there have, I, I've been receiving anecdotal accounts of people using these to vote online um, when they were not authorized to do so. Um, in terms of voter privacy, the other component to online voting uh, is that typically in cities that only offer online voting, they do have a telephone voting option, and so they'll, they'll say things like this in their procedures, you know, maybe don't use a party line. So a party line, um, it, it, like I had to go and ask my grandmother, uh, who was around uh, when, when telephones were first uh, deployed in Ontario, uh, it's, it's basically a line that everyone shares in a sort of a little kind of region, region. So maybe don't cast your vote on the party line as their suggestion, you know, great advice. Um, and for a lot of older voters, and a lot of people that don't have technology, so that, that, that grandmother I have, she's in her 90s, she's never used a computer and will never use a computer. Uh, she also can't see very well, so she needs help to vote. Um, so if you don't have access to computers or um, you are struggling with the instructions, and many older voters, again, I, I, people are writing me, telling me about um, their, their, you know, their, their grandparent having trouble, you can go to one of these voter assistance stations at the mall. So this is in the hallway of the shopping mall, and you can vote on this computer and this guy can stand there and help you do it. Uh, so, and, I mean, like they actually stand over your shoulder and help you mark uh, the, the ballot if you're having trouble, which is what was happening. And so, you know, ballot secrecy there is maybe not uh, what we're used to in the paper ballot method. Another issue is the, the, the fundamental non-transparency of online voting and the tabulation. So, um, these are the procedures for counting online ballots. Uh, they look something like this. The vendor shows up with a memory card in a security envelope uh, that's opened, given to the clerk. The clerk plugs it into a city computer. The results pop up and um, the winner's declared. So if I'm a scrutineer observing this, I don't know what I have observed. I mean, I could be observing anything, I, you know, I, you know, David Copperfield, I don't know. And 
So far, it seems that they're getting away with doing this, um, but this is going to become a big problem, as we've seen in other countries with controverted elections. And I'm already getting phone calls about people saying the result that was in their city was not one that was expected. Uh, maybe not because of actual hacking, but you know, maybe for political reasons, you know, polling is not always accurate. But uh, they're starting to ask questions, and um, online voting is going to uh, be in their sites. Uh, so um, we'll see what happens with that. So I won't say anything more until we know more. Uh, another big issue is the right to decline a ballot. So this is um, this is a this is an important uh, tool that the voter has. Uh, there's some debate about how effective of a tool it is, but it's a tool used to, to, to protest a vote. Um, you can spoil a ballot by, you know, on an op like a paper ballot, you can write all sorts of angry messages, political statements, and so forth. Um, and that's a very passionate way to, to kind of um, show your dissatisfaction or your protest. Uh, a more cerebral, uh, more emotionally, you know, even way to show your protest is by formally declining your ballot. And the Municipal Elections Act has provisions for how to decline a ballot on paper. You go and you say, uh, I formally decline my ballot, they take it, they, they write on it in a big sharpie and they put it in a separate envelope. Those ballots are counted and reported. So we actually know how many people are declining their ballot and some political scientists use it as a measure of dissatisfaction. Um, so what does the online version of this look like? Well, some systems do this. Here they have an explicit right to, uh, explicit checkbox to to spoil it or decline. Uh, but because municipalities are making up their own uh, uh, rules, uh, sometimes they are overlooking it. And we've seen reports of many cities simply not having any explicit procedures for declining a ballot using an online system. So, um, so residents in, for example, Meaford, Ontario, actually um, complained to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and then uh, they, they came out with a set of procedures. Now, if you want to decline your ballot, you actually have to go to one of the help centers and formally declare it. So it's kind of like you have to do something different if you want to decline, if, if you want to, uh, as opposed to if you want to vote. But the problem was that this was, <laughs> this, this, this procedure came out the morning of election day. Uh, so I, I, I don't know why it didn't uh, come until that time, but it, it seems that maybe they didn't think about it. Um, you know, serving vulnerable code uh, with known vulnerabilities. Uh, we've seen this before. Jeremy and I wrote the security report for the city of Toronto uh, during 2013. Um, so we saw that happening there. Um, and then, of course, there's the big, the big incident that uh, you, you might have all heard about uh, involving Dominion's uh, co-location provider um, improperly setting the bandwidth restriction and it um, causing the voting uh, websites of 51 municipalities to basically um, become unavailable for uh, the official count was about 90 minutes, uh, but I've been hearing anecdotal accounts of like well over two hours. So uh, some of the uh, municipalities extended their voting by several hours. Some even added an entire day to the vote. So the, the vote totals, the election outcome was delayed by a day. Um, and, uh, and some actually declaring essentially states of emergency over it. Okay, so here's the conclusion. The Municipal Elections Act specifies one rule for paper ballots, but there are 194 distinct sets of rules for online voting in terms of procuring it, delivering it, and counting it. So we need to think about this because there are serious cybersecurity challenges. Um, one that gets lost in the media often is the transparency. This is what is arguably the greater risk. I mean, we're not guaranteed to be hacked, um, although it seems that in the long term it's, it's inevitable, but we're not guaranteed to be hacked. But we don't have a result that is counted in a transparent fashion. The long-term result would be a, a, a eventual loss in confidence uh, in the democratic institutions, uh, which is just um, a, a bad thing, for lack of a better word. So here is here here it is in a nutshell. In political science, um, it's 
you know, th there's a lot of obvious benefits to online voting. Uh, it is seen as an empowering tool for cities uh, and an empowering tool for voters. So me standing here as a computer scientist and criticizing it is something that is not maybe a message that's always well received because of the perceived benefits of it. Nevertheless, there is an international research community focused on the cybersecurity of online voting who are adamant that in its current form, we cannot realistically proceed with it in a way that's, that's acceptable, provides acceptable properties until we can address some of these issues. But the political reality of Ontario is that cities are already doing it. The cities are hugely diverse, so we can't realistically have a one-size-fits-all solution for them. They have enormous regional autonomy, so um, one thing that won't work is for us to um, get Ontario to step in and say, okay, now you're gonna do it this way. Uh, that will not likely fly politically, although I'm an engineer, so you can sort of uh, maybe debate that. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll see, but I think what's important to realize here is that uh, online voting is not going to stop. Uh, well, until we see an actual uh, an actual malicious attack that changes uh, the outcome, we might see it stop then, but until that happens, and we might not necessarily find out if it happens, uh, until then, it's not going to stop. So, we're already doing it, we're going to keep doing it, so if you can't beat them, join them, um, and we can improve our odds, so really what we're talking about is the need for standards, some kind of list of documents. Here are the 10 things that a city should be asking a vendor uh, or requiring them to have present in their product. Um, and realistically, the standards will have to be voluntary, similar to what uh, the Council of Europe has, similar to what the US Election Assistance Commission has, um, a, a sort of clearinghouse of information that um, electoral management bodies uh, can um, uh, tap into so that uh, some of these uh, smaller cities are on the level playing field with some of the larger cities that have larger budgets to investigate this issue. So um, that's it. Thank you.